So I'm just telling you with passion and idea and commitment, you can do anything you set out to do. to the She Speaks podcast, a podcast created to elevate women's voices across diverse backgrounds on topics impacting women. I'm your host, Aliza Freud, founder and CEO of She Speaks. Each week, I have a conversation with a woman expert who shares her best how-to advice on a topic so we can learn how to better do that one thing from a woman who's been there and done that. Our hope is that these conversations help you feel more inspired to speak up and be heard in your own life and work. Now, on to the episode. Welcome back to the show. Hope you're all having a great week so far. So this whole month is Women's History Month, and all month long what we've been trying to do is feature different women who we believe are trying to help progress other women and bring other women along through the work that they do. And I have such an, a great episode for you today. We have not one, but two guests. First, we have Paige Morrow Kimball. She is a director, a producer, a writer of award-winning films. She has been um, on HBO. She's directed 14 Sesame Street movies. In addition to that, she is also the co-founder of the Women's Director Advocacy Group, Best Director her, which is really aimed at trying to get more more director awards for women. So we talk about Paige's journey, how she got started, and how she thinks you know the industry has evolved for women and what is next in the film industry. So first we have that and then that interview. And then after that, we actually have an interview with my daughter, Zoe McKay. And Zoe is a senior in high school. She started the Women in Film Club at her high school um, just this past year and has had really great response to it. So we talk about that, why she felt there was a need for women in film in her school and what are why the club became so popular so quickly and what are some of the things that her generation, uh, the Gen Zers, are talking about as it relates to film and seeing representation of women in film. So we're going to share those episodes with you today, both of those conversations with you today, starting with Paige. And here we go. Paige, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Elisa. I'm very happy to be here. Well, we have been wanting to talk with somebody like you who has been creating content. You are a director, a writer, a producer, an actor. You have you have done all of it in um, the entertainment business and with Women's History Month, month of March, we really wanted to talk to a filmmaker like you who could share with us more about your experience in the industry and also how that's ev- how it's evolving for women. So let me first start by asking you to share your story. How did you get involved? How did you take on these four roles? Are they all kind of equal to you? Does one, do you enjoy one more than the other? Tell us, tell us more about yourself. I mean, so many feelings, so little time. (laughs) And such a long road. I guess, you know, from the beginning, I knew I was a filmmaker. I knew I was a storyteller. I knew it was going to be in some sort of either writing or filmmaking or, you know, producing or directing, um, acting, all something. Because I, when I was very, very young, my dad, who is actually a radio personality, but his hobby was filmmaking. And so in our apartment in Brooklyn, where I, I was little and grew up, he had a Steenbeck, which is a flatbed editor, celluloid editor in our closet. And so he worked the night shift. I never, ever saw my dad, but on Sundays, which was his day off, that was the glorious day because I got to spend time with my dad and we would make films together. And so from a very young age, I was just hooked. Yeah. Um, Great Cookie Bake was the first epic that I directed and my brother starred in. And you know, that was it. Uh, I went to NYU. I, I started in music videos um, early on. And then I worked for, um, in New York, Olympic documentaries, um, a guy named Bud Greenspan, and we traveled the world with them. It was so awesome. And so I loved the uplifting, inspiring stories of athletes. Oh, wow. So you, you worked on those Olympic documentaries that I used to just eat up? 
Yeah, Bud was such a great mentor to me in many ways. And he always focused on the human spirit, either you know, the, the triumph of the win or the the heartbreak of the loss. I mean, it was so there was so much there. And it was just, it was beautiful. It was a great few years and traveled the world, went to China, Japan, you know, all over France. I mean, it, that was a great opportunity. Um, and then I decided to move out to Los Angeles. I started working um, for Oprah. I worked for Oprah for a while. I did a lot of her celebrity interviews as a TV. Oh, producer. wow. I worked on Project Greenlight for HBO, and that sort of morphed into reality shows, um, you know, dating shows, and we call, we used to call them epic cheese, <laughs> but they were romantic and they were fun, you know, so I worked on several of those and worked my way up um, to supervising producer. Um, and let me tell you, it wasn't easy at that time, especially coming up as a woman, you know, starting in sports, first of all, and then even just in television and being a producer, a supervising producer was was very challenging. And there were many, many roadblocks. I think now things are starting to change. But at the time, it was really before we recognized that certain things were not OK at the workplace <laughs> And that it was harder. You know, we didn't even see it. It took the millennials, I think, to kind of shake us and say, yeah, that's not okay. Um, And they were like, yeah, they're right. Wait a second. So um, I, you know, I went on to produce many shows for television. And just as I was peaking as a supervising producer, I, you know, had met my husband and uh, we had, I was pregnant with my first child. I thought I wouldn't miss a beat. And I know you relate because you're nodding. And I realized as I started to try to really find the balance of both motherhood and being the very, you know, high producing uh, television supervising producer, that something had to give and I couldn't do both really well. And in fact, as I chose not to do both right then. So I quit and I decided when I was jealous of my nanny, I realized something was wrong. I just was, I was seeing like, you know, I was in the pit at NASCAR. Okay. With those big, huge headphones. And I worked on a show called, for FX called NASCAR driver. People would kill to work on that show. It was so cool. We were following around race car drivers all day, but I, my breasts were leaking and I was exhausted and thinking about, oh, my nanny, she's just got such a great job. I was like, what the hell am I doing? So, um, yeah, so I just, I stopped for a while. And then as I stayed home with my girls, always realizing, look, I'm creative, you know. So I started writing for the Huffington Post. I started acting at that time because acting was much more part-time, you know. And I felt like I could still work and be on set and yet not have to be away from my family for long stretches of time, that it, that it was sustainable. So after I was an actor for a while, I started realizing that the parts for women in their 40s were very far and few between. So what did I do? Create content. And I started to create, write, act in, and create stories, short films about women. And women, fe- female characters, you know, and moms and sort of the people of color. And just, I started to really explore. I cast myself in them. And then I just sort of went, I like it behind the camera too. So I just started to create. And that's what, another thing I tell people, create content, do your thing, you know, tell a story and you can really create something from it. That launched me. One film I did was called Ending Up and that was a divorce comedy. And I'm not divorced. I've been married to the same person for 20 years, but it was a what if I was imagining what if, how do you, we were, our lives were so crunched. So I made that film and started getting out some attention on the festival circuit. And then I made play date, which really did well. It won awards. It was a short film about a little girl who discovers a homeless woman in her backyard. She decides to invite her inside for a play date and her parents are distracted and don't notice and I spoke to the distraction we face as parents, the invisibility of homelessness and really taught kids about empathy and Sesame Street saw it. They hired me to start creating some original films for them. I love that. Okay. So I want to pause for a second to talk about that a little bit, because what an incredibly important lesson maybe for younger filmmakers or aspiring filmmakers who are thinking to themselves, well, how do I get hired to go do that thing? You're, it sounds like what you did was you said, I'm going to make the content. I'm going to make content that is interesting to me. I'm going to write. I'm going to produce. I'm going to direct. I'm going to do this and put it out there, put it out there into the world. 
And you did that. And then lo and behold, you got hired. Sesame Street sees it and decides to hire you. I, I do think that you can, you, you just have to start. I do think you can do it yourself and just creating content, practicing, getting better and better at it, using your voice from your own unique perspective, because we're all different. You know, my stuff is uplifting. I, I look at, I look at life and story through the lens of positivity. Some other people are dark. They want to look at social impact and, you know, take a tra- more tragic angle or edgy I have heard you talk about the fact that you had to take a look at yourself and decide what you were about and who you were. And you said you realized that your orientation, that you looked at the world through a lens of positivity. I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about this idea of how do you get in touch with that self-awareness? How do you get in touch with who you are and what you, you know, what is important to you? Because I do know that from talking with lots of women um, who we interact with, that they tell us that they struggle with self-awareness. Do you have any advice or tips that you can share for how a woman can get in touch with that? I think it's a long road and a short road in my case. I think the long road is just trying things and, and trying to go from an authentic place, not trying to be someone else. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. Oprah does what Oprah does so well. Because that's what she does. And that's her gift, right? But not everybody does that. And so what is it that you you just, and I think by doing, you learn. I used to feel like you had to hide that. You know, you had to pick one. Like you couldn't be jack of all trades. But now, no more, ladies. Be you and shout it to the world who you are and find what connects them all. Because I bet it does. Yeah, I love that. And I was going to ask you, because we talked, I mentioned before, you do have directing, writing, producing, acting. If you had to choose one of those to do for the rest of your life, what would it be? Ask me tomorrow and the answer might be different from today. Like right now, I'm really lit up about making another documentary, you know, so I have a feature in development. I have a short that I'm just kind of circling around. It just really, it's just it's the day. And then I have an audition to do in, in next week. And I'm like, oh, yes, I get to dive into this audition. I really think um, for me personally, the reason I do so many things is because I love to do all these things. Right. And hopefully that's, you know, you get to do many things, right? And that's the other thing that I alert, have learned as I've gotten older is that we have seasons, right, in our life. And, you know, there are seasons where we are dialed up on the focusing on being the mom because that's when you know our kids need us at that point there are seasons where we're focused on other things and 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 that is i think that's been the hard part of coming from you know gen- maybe a generation or so ago right well certainly my mom's generation where you kind of you know, you were a mom. That's what you did. You didn't really have a whole lot of other options. I have that same experience with my mom. In fact, I wrote a screenplay about it that's now a feature. Presently, it's entitled Late Bloomers. Um, But it's about feminism in the 1970s, the early 70s, and how she did not know what being an independent woman was. And she went from husband number, went from parents to husband's home number one to husband number two. And there was no real exploration of that self for her. This film is a love letter to her. It's like, what if she had made different choices? What if she had become an independent woman sooner? What would that have looked like? I love that. Well, and what a gift it is to be able to explore that. And I, and I, I think, you know, I know I asked you the question earlier about self-awareness, but I wonder if for someone like you who writes and you have creativity as a big part of what you do on a day-to-day basis, maybe that is part of, of that awareness. Like maybe through that writing process, you become more aware. A hundred percent. That's why my answer was first go out and do stuff like experiment, explore, you know, my latest film I shot on an iPhone. It's won nine awards. That's amazing. So I'm just telling you, with passion and idea and commitment, you can do anything you set out to do. Let's talk a little bit about, if we can, the evolution of women in film and entertainment. 
I know that you and I were just talking before we started recording about that the test that the Bechdel test, which I believe what that does is it was created as a way to really determine whether women were being represented fairly and equally and with enough time in film um, as their as their male counterparts. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your perspective, having been in the industry, how maybe it's changed for women and what maybe still needs improvement? Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's certainly changed. Um, I think there's more content that's created about us, especially women of a certain age, for mm-hmm. us, by us. I, was, I, I started really noticing it when I came back as a mom, you know, when I was a mom for a few years, stopped working and then tried to come back. And I did that really through my my union, one of my unions, the DGA that I'm in, the Directors Guild. And I was writing about my experiences there for the Huffington Post. And, and one of the things I noticed was that there were just so few of us in the DGA. And, you know, speaking to like the ladies' room, you know how the ladies' room is always a longer line than any than men's room? Not at the DGA. You get right in. That's the one good thing. Um, <laughs> but there's a, a serious lack of, I think, you know, women, women's stories. So I just, I just decided that I was going to try to move the needle, you know, myself writing about it at first. Um, then a group of women at the DGA, DGA directors, we, we came together and co-founded a group called Best Direct Her, where we were noticing that there weren't enough directing awards given to women. Why is that? Because there aren't that many and we don't have the same budgets on our films. I do think there is a move towards changing the climate, you know, and and, uh, people like Ava DuVernay just go out of their way to do what they can to make a change, a positive change. And I have so much respect for that. And my company is Macazan Films. Um, Mac and Zan are my name for my daughters because it's them going up and seeing not only me as a role model, but films that, stories that reflect them. But we're doing um, an independent uh, directing program and it's open to everybody but I especially encourage people who are traditionally underrepresented in the entertainment industry to apply and um, you need some experience and and, and uh, there's going to be information on my website about that this is what I do try to change it I mean look I'm not a powerful person of change but I can make my own change it's like what can we contribute? How can you mentor somebody? How can you put your arm around a woman? How about moms coming back to work? I mean, that was a huge. And so that's one of the things I tried to embrace and try to give people a chance um, because they're not getting those chances necessarily. You know, people of color, people of, with disabilities, all of that. It's important. Going back to that orientation you talked about earlier about positivity, and it is not always the where where we end up especially you know if you've had to work a lot harder maybe than than men did to get to a place it's not always the idea that you're going to actually turn around and give the person behind you a leg up but the fact that you have taken that approach is it's a testament to you and it's a wonderful gift for the women who are going to be able to take advantage of that program can you talk a little bit about your favorite films can do you have a favorite and and why? Well, it's so hard. To, they're all like my children, right? So it's I hard know, to be favorite. Right. But I, I will. I'll talk about the the new one because I'm just so excited and lit up about it. It's really opened so many doors, and I think it's important because it starts with me being a mom and stuck at home during the pandemic with two teenage girls who, and it was just mm-hmm. as we talked about, it was so devastating for these kids. You know, kids in you know, teens and and early twenties. I think it was really, really, especially tough for them. And so I started taking these walks in my neighborhood to try to stay sane, right? And just to be a better mom and try to keep my my head about me. And I was looking for any sign of positivity. And I started photographing just from my Instagram um, pictures of, you know, people put signs in their windows. I don't know about where you live, but here in Los Angeles, people put signs in their windows in this urban, huge city. And it was like, hang in there. We're with you, you know, you know, cel- celebrate love, all this stuff. And on one walk, I started seeing these trash sculptures, like a repurposed junk art up in the telephone poles. And they said things like, be love, laugh often, big hugs. And there were these whimsical characters. And I was like, who makes these? 
what these artists are so uplifting. They made me happy. Went home, researched online, couldn't find anything about this person, except that other people had the same question. One day on a walk, I took different routes every day. I saw this sculpture in a front yard in this very brightly colored house. And this woman in her 60s walked out at that moment. She looked like a mad scientist because she had the goggles around her neck. She was carrying stuff. And I said, excuse me, are you the artist who does the telephone pole sculptures? And she said, why, yes, but don't tell anyone. (laughs) I was like, who are you? What is your story? So we started chatting. Um, I told her I was a filmmaker that I'd worked in, you know, for Sesame Street and would love to just kind of interview her. Mm -hmm. And what transpired is that for a year and a half, she lives right down the street from me. I took my iPhone and I started following her around through her process and interviews. And I would create this film and she would create her art. And what it was like stepping in a puddle that turned out to be a lake. Because Mm. what I found was that she would dress up like a man, like a male Mm. utility worker, climb up the telephone poles and hang these beautiful sculptures just to spread joy anonymously to uplift her neighborhood. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And then as we started bonding and getting closer, her backstory started coming out. And it was a story of darkness in her childhood that she turned around to positivity. And it was so inspiring. This film has just, it's called Powers. It's a short documentary. It just got some distribution. We'll be announcing that soon, but it's on the film festival circuit. And it's just, it's won nine awards. I shot it on my iPhone. But it's just to inspire others that, A, it's never too late to do what you love because she's in her 60s and she only was an artist for the last 10 years. And that you can take what you've been given and turn it around and create your own. As I said to you, I'm very scrappy. Just make, make shit. Go out and make shit. And as Lori Powers says, that's who the film is is about. Do your thing. Just make shit. And, you know, I'm happy to to support in, in any way I can. All right. Well, my last question for you. What do you wish you could tell your younger self? Oh, my goodness. That's a good one. It all happens when it's supposed to happen. Trust. Trust yourself. Really listen to your intuition. And it's all going to work out so great. Just definitely marry the guy. I would tell her definitely. Marry the guy. <laughs> that was a good choice. Well, Paige, if people want to follow you, learn more about your your movies, with the work that you're doing, what is the best way for them to do that? Um, well, you can follow me on Instagram at Paige Morrow Kimball. And you can also follow me. You can check out my website and sign up for our newsletters at macazanfilms.com. Paige, thank you so much for spending this time with us today. I'm delighted. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. We're taking a quick break to say that if you're enjoying this episode, you can subscribe wherever you're listening. We would also love for you to join the She Speaks community. It's free to join, and you'll get the chance to have first access to surveys, giveaways, sampling opportunities, and great content like this very podcast. All links are in the show notes. Now, back to the show. And now, here's my episode with Zoe McKay. Let's talk a little bit about your interest first um, in film. Like, why film? What is interesting to you about film? I always knew I wanted to do something like in performance and visual. And then it just kind of came to film because I love the idea of like writing something and then producing it and then going on to edit it and all that kind of stuff. Let's talk a little bit about the women in film club. So you started the women in film club at your high school. It had not existed. You saw that there was, or felt that there was a need for it. You started it. The club has been really successful. You have had some really great traction with it. Can you talk about first, why did you decide that your high school needed a women in film club? Okay. Well, first of all, the film club, my school wasn't totally active it was like kind of like on and off active, but like not really like a consistent thing. And also like, I feel like film is such a male dominated space, like pretty much anything it is, but there's a specific kind of like, you know, like that film bro kind of thing where you to be accepted or to be like well-versed in film, you have to 
be so familiar with a very specific subset of it. And you have to like know these really obscure directors or you have to like your favorite movie has to be something out there or, or like no one has ever heard of it before. So I said to my friend Caspi and I was like, we should start our own film club, you know, one that's actually going to meet. And I let's talk about like the people in film who like are obscure, but just because no one's really talking about their work, it's not cool to like this random woman's like South by Southwest film as cool as is to like Francis Ford Coppola's really old work. We need, we need something where a space that is a accepting to anyone. You can come in either being the most well-versed in film ever and having like eight different movies out at different festivals or like you just kind of like movies a space that's totally inclusive and also to not being a space that's committed to not being like a knowledge war about movies or like who has the best opinion but just like talking about the people who are the future of film and the people who are making amazing things but not necessarily getting so much attention for it which is why we like to do stuff like we'll give them random prompts out of a hat and they'll go make their own like movie or like we'll review student work from within the school and we'll talk about it. Like, like a space that's so focused on just making sure that everyone has a voice and everyone has an opportunity to show something that they love. What are some of the things that you think have come from these conversations that people should know about as it relates to women in film? We started as a really like Socratic seminar based thing, but we realized since it's so much more fun if we just get really hands on with it and we get people like making up their own characters or making up whatever and like just getting to share with each other. But I think in the early time and the or this earliest part of having this club where we were talking about just different stuff, having discussions, we would like learn about like how many things that everyone just kind of agrees on, but they feel like they're not allowed to talk about it. Maybe like it, like it angers this certain group of people who have such a chokehold on what is allowed to be talked about. Like if you just get down, if you sit in a circle of a bunch of people and they're like, I really don't like how I'm treated by this specific group of people. Or like, I want to be right sometimes about film or I don't even need to be right. I just want to say what's on my mind, but feeling like you're not really allowed to do that because you're just going to get absolutely demolished if you do. But just having, making sure that like there is the space to talk about that, even though it's, the club is called Women in Film, it's not exclusive to women. Like we encourage anyone who has an opinion and wants to talk to show up and like just say what's on their mind. We just like stress if you're going to come, be respectful of those around you, but just come with an open mind and an understanding that this is meant to be a safe space. Can you talk about your generation, Gen Z? You have a perspective about how women are portrayed in films, traditionally portrayed. Can we first talk about some of the things that you've picked up on the, as it relates to portrayal of women in film? We've come a long way from like the certain tropes that you'll see in movies like the damsel in the stress, like the 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 vixen, all that kind of stuff, which did stem early on from specific morality codes that a lot of films had, like a lot of studios had in place. Like if there was a woman who cheated on her husband or is evil, she either had, had to end up married or dead by the end of the movie. That was like a specific part of the Hayes Code. Went was meant to show a strict morality in certain movies. Um, oh, wow. That- I didn't even know that. Yeah, it's really cool stuff. Not cool, but like it's like interesting. Interesting, yeah. To remember, sure. yeah. So there, we've come a long way from the Hayes Code, but even like there's still remnants of it where there's a strict morality that's like put on it. Or if you think back to like these big blockbuster movies, the women in it are either like completely celibate, man-hating scientists who end up married by the end of it to like the the hero, or they're like, already married to the hero and they're like mothers so even if we're not trying even if that's like not a deliberate thing it's like the specific roles we have in our heads for what women can be and what they can do in film and then even if you try to break that like one time we talked about in the club like the marvel cinematic universe which not gonna lie i do love like it's sparked a lot of my current love and passion for film 
but a lot of it can be a lot of like their like big girl power moments can just feel like that they're just like really performative girl power moments where all they're like they're like like, like walking in a group to the camera and like yeah that can be really cool in retrospect but when that's the only screen time a lot of them have during this battle it just feels really like what was that? it just feels so performative so I, I feel like true representation comes with a not being a stereotype which as we progress like it, it's still prevalent it's not like the biggest thing but also making sure that any representation isn't performative just kind of like a fo- like something that needs to be fulfilled in order to like make a certain audience happy and that goes the same for like representation of people of color and people in the LGBTQ community, their representation in media too, like having it not exist solely as a stereotype and going into that area of representation where it doesn't define who they are, but it's also not completely detached from it. Stephen Yun um, and Riz Ahmed have had this really great actors on actors segment where they talked about the three stages of representation. Stage one is a stereotype. Stage two is having a personality and an identity, but still being pretty connected to their culture. And stage three is just being com- the two like living completely separately. Like there's a black character, they never bring it up. Gay character, never really bring it up. And I feel like the happy medium sits in between stages two and three, where you want to make sure that like you have these rich characters who are obviously not defined by their sexual orientation or their gender or their race but it's also not completely absent from who they are because that's just not how anything works your identity is built up off of yes your traits your experiences your like how you've grown up but it's also not independent from those other factors who make you who you are one of the things that i have observed about women and I've certainly seen this a lot in politics, but also I feel like I've seen this in um, entertainment, whether television, film, whatever it is. We seem to have a lower tolerance for women being multifaceted, flawed characters, meaning, you know, having good and bad in them. More, we more readily accept that men have good and bad but we don't seem to accept that as willingly with women, with female characters. And I'm curious if you all have talked about that in in your club or you've thought about that and what your perspective is on it. Oh, I've totally thought about that. It's the same reason why you see people like Joaquin Phoenix uh, getting praised for his performance in The Joker, which is like so, which is like the definition of like an anti-hero kind of thing where it's like, the origin story of the Joker, who's like one of the most notorious villains of all time, but people love this guy because he's like so multifaceted and like he has like these really complex origins for all this stuff. But like if you get that on like the side of like a woman, it's not taken as easily. And I obviously, I, honestly, I'm not completely separate from having those biases too because they're it's just what they are, they're biases. That internalized misogyny of the film world and like the, the of the anything world. It's also, like, evident in the most, spoiler alert, not the most recent, but the second to most recent Scream movie where one of the killers was a woman. And everyone was like, I don't really like that. She's like, like, she feels like a poser. She feels, like, really crazy. She was doing, like, basically an impression of the guy from the first Scream movie, of, like, Matthew Lillard's performance. People love that guy. So there's always going to be that double standard of, like, loving it when this dude gives, like, this really, like, creepy, like, really fun performance of a villain. But then when a woman does it, she's out of her damn mind. For you, what is the gold standard, like, your favorite portrayal of a woman, either in television or film, and why? That's a good question. I'm, like, looking up at the posters on my wall. I'm trying to figure it out. I love Little Women. I love Joe March, but I think that the issue with her character is that so much of her liberation comes with rejecting femininity and so like obviously rejecting femininity. And I feel like that's a lot of the direction, like especially with like the Little Women musical, a lot of them take is like she's not a girl anymore and that's great. Like I feel like that's why I kind of like, I kind of like Meg better. I love Meg. She's so fun. Like I love her. She she she's the one who goes into this role, this traditional role of motherhood 
and being a wife and taking care of a home. And she's like so caring and she's so loving, but it's not a detriment to her. It truly makes her so happy. And she like wants to have this, she wants to have that role of being a mom and being, being like a wife and taking care of people because that's just who she is to her core. Joe doesn't get that. She's like, I, she's like, why would you want that? Like we should go and we should run off and we should be ourselves and we should just never get married. She's like, this makes me happy. So I'm going to go do this. And that's why I really like Greta Gerwig's um, movie because like it's shown that it just makes her so truly happy and like getting married is something she definitely wants because she's in love. So I feel like that's just a really great portrayal of like a traditional woman that doesn't get praised enough. I love that. Well, Zoe, thank you so much for talking to me about with this. You know, I, I love hearing your perspective. I think it's also really cool to hear like your generation of like you as a voice of your generation talking about, you know, about this really important. Like we, we get so much from film, entertainment, television, like all of that. We, we, it's so much a part of our culture and how we think. So I always think it is a really important part of how, you know, we as a people think about things and I love hearing like the next generation, hopefully, of filmmakers, of people who are going to be writing those stories and sharing those stories. So thank you for spending time with me today. My pleasure. If you'd like to learn more about our guests this week or how you can join the She Speaks community, check out the links in the show notes. Thanks for listening and looking forward to our next conversation. Thank you for listening. If you're an influencer or a brand that wants to work with us, please feel free to email us at info at Until next time.